Nam zależy.pl. Merytoryczne źródło informacji. Partnerzy kanału. Sklep Nam zależy. Najlepsze biznesowe i gospodarcze książki dla dzieci. Nadrabiamy to, o czym milczą w szkołach. Adsfox. Połączenie narzędzi i usługi do tworzenia skuteczniejszych kampanii reklamowych w internecie. Dear viewers, today on our channel we'll be talking to Alex Epstein. Hello Alex. Hi, how are you? Alexander Joseph Epstein, born in 1980, is an American author who advocates for the expansion of fossil fuels and who rejects the scientific consensus on climate change. Epstein is the author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, 2014, and Fossil Future, 2022, in which he argues for the expanded use of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. Alex, do you recognize this book, by the way? Uh, I haven't seen that cover. I yeah, that cover. yeah. In, in Polish, in Polish. They gotta, they, gotta, they gotta send me one. By the way, that, that, uh, that bio is from Wikipedia, which is pretty wildly inaccurate throughout the, that was only partially inaccurate at the beginning, but it gets worse. So just so people don't know, I don't endorse that. Okay. Alex, for the first time you will appear on our channel Nam Zależy, which literally means we do care. It is a very popular channel in Poland with almost 400,000 subscribers. Wow. And uh, let's start talking about you. When you first, when you appeared before some congressional committee as an expert, a woman from the left wanted to discredit you and started asking you about your education. She asked, you, you are a philosopher by profession, right? You said, yes. Then why did you come here? And you said that to teach you how to think. So is it true? Yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's all more or less what happened. People can see it on YouTube. Her name is Barbara Boxer, B-O-X-E-R. So she's actually was my senator at the time from California. Now she's, she's since retired, but yeah. Her, and she really reflects a certain idea about this issue of energy that often comes up, which is people have the idea that the only relevant qualification is to be a climate scientist, which that yeah. should be absurd on its face, because climate, insofar as it comes up with energy, is a side effect of energy use. But there's still yeah. a question of who's an expert on all the benefits of energy. And then in terms of, and I happen to be an expert on that. Do. But then there's, an ex there's a question of, well, how do you think about complex issues? And I really think that's where philosophy comes in. So the, the fact that she thought, oh, being a philosopher is going to discredit me, I think shows the, the poverty of the discussion and how, how obsessed it is just with climate science and not with thinking methodology and not with energy. Yeah, I think that the key issue, it will be how to think about complex uh, systems. So my first question is, could you briefly introduce yourself to our viewers and explain how it happened that being so young, you dare to teach others how to think? Yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm not very young anymore. I'm 43 going on 44. So that's <laughs> part of it. Um, but I've been at this, this particular issue for 17 years. And I guess I've been interested in philosophy since I was a teenager. So the, you know, the very short version is I came from a very strong math science background. So I was at one of the top math science high schools in the United States. I studied quite a bit of math and science in, in pursuing a computer science minor at Duke University, which is one of the leading universities. Uh, but as a teenager, I really became obsessed with philosophy which most people think of as an impractical subject and I think of as the most practical subject. And the reason it's most practical is because it studies the fundamental principles that guide all of our thinking and all of our action. And one issue is thinking methods. So when we're thinking about something, what's the process? What's the method we're going through? And one thing that happened with the issue of fossil fuels, which I was raised with the conventional view of that we should try to get rid of them, that they're causing climate catastrophe, but then I started learning about some unique benefits of fossil fuels, like the ability of fossil fuels to provide fertilizer for billions of people, or the, the unique ability of fossil fuels to provide diesel fuel, which is by far our best agricultural fuel. And I realized that, wait a second, fossil fuels have some unique benefits going forward, but we're not talking about those. We're only talking about negative side effects on climate. And I thought just as it's wrong to only look at the negative side effects of a prescription drug, it's also 
wrong to only look at the negative side effects of an energy source. And that got me interested in, well, what are the facts? What are, what are the actual benefits and side effects of fossil fuels compared to the alternatives? And ultimately, that made me a big advocate of fossil fuels, since I think most of the world is, is getting it wrong. Yeah. What, what do you mean when you say that our civilization depends on fossil fuels? So if you think of our, our civilization, you know, people would experience this as an advanced way of life, including a huge amount of opportunity and a very high life expectancy and very related to opportunity income. So we, we live in this very advanced world, and I think people experience it that way. They have some at least vague knowledge that we live a lot longer than people used to. I don't think people know we live more than twice as long as people used to in the very recent past. We have, you know, 10 or more times the income, which means effective resources as people in the past. And then the planet can now accommodate 8 billion people at a much higher standard of living than it could accommodate 1 billion people. And so there's a question of why is the world so good now for human beings versus the past? And it's, it's a good time to do this because we're, we're right after, as we're recording this, right, right after so-called Earth Day, which at least in the United States is a huge holiday where we talk about how we've ruined the earth, but yet the earth is much more habitable for human beings than it's ever been. And we should really uh, analyze this. And I think one of the, if you, if you think about it, one of the fundamental causes is we used to just have to subsist on manual labor, which is very weak force. And now we have what I call machine labor, which is we can use machines to do physical work for us. And this is crucially important because contrary to the view that the earth is this really nice, hospitable place, it's actually very naturally deficient in usable resources. That's why we're so poor throughout history. And it's very high in naturally occurring threats, including climate related threats like storms and floods and extreme temperatures. And with just manual labor, we can't uh, overcome the natural inhospi inhospitability of earth. We need machines. Uh, but for machines to be usable, we need energy to be as cheap as possible, as reliable as possible, and as versatile as possible. So able to power every type of machine, including flying machines, which really only oil is good for. Uh, and we need it to be as scalable as possible, available to billions of people in thousands of places. And what you find is that this, so the machines have made our lives infinitely more abundant and safe, but they require this cost-effective and scalable energy and fossil fuels are the only thing that's that's been able to provide low cost, reliable, versatile energy on a scale of billions of people in thousands of places. That's why I say it's fundamental to civilization as we know it. Okay, and what what most people don't know about access to energy in the modern world, especially in poorer countries. Yeah, this is this is a big thing, and I, I was just noticing it yesterday. Someone who is very smart, um, financial person, was sending me some criticisms. Of, of my book. And one thing I noticed was he sort of said, yeah, fossil fuels have some benefits. And then he immediately got obsessed with climate. But he didn't once acknowledge the fact that I stress over and over in fossil future in my work, which is that the world is desperately short of energy. And one stat I like to indicate this is we have 3 billion people who use less electricity than a typical American refrigerator does. We have 6 billion people who use an amount of energy that we in the U.S would consider totally unacceptable. So if you view the world as energy poor and you recognize that right now fossil fuels can provide energy like, like no other technology or industry can, you start to see, well, there's a strong benefit of expanding fossil fuel use. And that's not even on the table for most people. It's either, it's just a question of how quickly do we get rid of fossil fuels? But I say, well, why not consider expanding them if they have so many benefits. And of course, it'll depend on how big the negative side effects are. So we can talk about that. But at least you should realize if you get rid of fossil fuels or even you keep them stagnant, you are doing harm to billions of people who would otherwise be able to get uh, some sort of decent amount of energy. Okay. And um, uh, you underline that uh, fossil fuels are cost effective. Uh, what makes it uniquely cost effective? I mentioned briefly the some of the dimensions of cost effective. So it's 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 affordable. So a lot of people uh, people can afford to use a lot of it. That's crucial. It's reliable. It's available when we need it and the quantity we need it. And then versatile, able to power every type of machine, not just electricity. Only about a fifth of the world's energy is electricity. 
And so we use fossil fuels a lot for heavy duty transportation, like airplanes and, and container ships. And then we all, we use it for agriculture and we also use it for a lot of heating uses. So often high amounts of heat for industry, we use it a lot for like natural gas, say for aluminum. And we often use it for residential heat, also say natural gas for residential heat because it's it's often the cheapest thing by far. So the question of, so in practice, we're using fossil fuels 80% of the time and even more so in transportation and even more so in industry. So the question of, of why that is, and I, I talk about this in depth in chapter five, but you can think of it as, as two things. One is that fossil fuels have a very special set of attributes that's hard to replicate. So one is they're naturally stored, which means they're like a natural battery versus say solar and wind, which are intermittent flows of energy. So the, you don't have them whenever you want them, you just have them when they happen to be available. It's really good to be stored because it's really expensive for man, man, for humans to store energy. So we want naturally stored energy. They're also naturally concentrated. So they can store a large amount of energy in a small amount of space, particularly oil is amazingly good at this, much better than say batteries. And then they're naturally abundant. There's a huge amount of them, you know, there's 10 times more fossil fuel in the ground of every type of fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas than we've used in the entire history of civilization. So kind of category one is they have these three attributes of natural storage, natural concentration, natural abundance. But then the other thing is they have a history of generations of economic achievement, which is very important. It's for any industry to succeed. So take like the, the microchip industry. It's not just enough for the physical potential to exist in nature, say with silicon. You need generations for people to figure out how to harness that potential, do it really efficiently in practice, do it around the world, refine your supply chains. That's been done with fossil fuels. It hasn't been done with that, anything else to that scale. So what we have is this, uh, they have an amazing head start with the attributes. Nuclear is the only thing that's close and in many ways nuclear is better in, the, in, in a lot of those respects, but nobody has the generations of economic achievement. So if you're talking about let's do solar and wind, which have a lot of natural deficits compared to fossil fuels and don't have that history of achievement, the idea that you're going to replace fossil fuels, that should be very suspicious to people. Okay. Could you explain the difference between the anti-impact framework and human flourishing framework? And by the way, did you coin this, uh, these terms? Yeah, so these, these are terms that I coined. I, I coined a decent number of terms and I, I try to avoid it unless it's necessary, but unfortunately, it is. It seems to be necessary in a lot of, of ways. And, and, and my reason, I think, is because I think we have an anti-human way of thinking about our environment. I think we've, we've accepted a lot of bad terms. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some more terms. But these terms are yeah, the anti-impact framework versus the human flourishing framework. So it's really a framework for how do we think about human life and specifically how do we think about our environment? And I think one perspective is that when we think of, say, the Earth as a whole, you know, our, our biggest local environment, our, the human flourishing framework says our goal should be to advance human flourishing on Earth. So we want the Earth to be the most hospitable, which means abundant, safe, opportunity-filled place for humans. Now, that doesn't mean that you are against the rest of nature, but it means that you want to manipulate or relate to the rest of nature in a way that's advantageous. So you preserve beautiful animals, but some animals you have to kill or you have to seal off, or you know, the malarial mosquito you, you might need to get rid of. So you have a, you're very pro-human in your interaction with your environment. And then you recognize part of this is what I call the wild potential premise. So you recognize that nature is not very hospitable, it's dynamic, it's deficient, it, in resources, it's dangerous, and we need to impact it a lot. So you embrace human impact done intelligently as a big virtue. You recognize we need to impact our environment a lot to be good. And this is very different from what I call the anti-impact framework, which says our goal shouldn't be to advance human flourishing on Earth. We should minimize or eliminate our impact on Earth. So the, the best Earth possible from an environmental perspective is the one that has the least human impact. And I think this is a deeply anti-human idea because we survive by intelligently impacting the earth. And one way they get away with this idea that we shouldn't impact the earth, which should be obviously an anti-human idea, is they pretend that if we don't impact the earth, the earth will be nice to us. And I call this the delicate nurturer assumption. The idea that nature on its own is stable, sufficient, safe, and our impact will just ruin it. So we just need to harmonize ourselves 
with the rest of nature and everything will be okay. But this is exactly what we did throughout our whole history. We already tried that experiment for 10,000 plus years, and it was a total failure in the sense of no one would ever go back to living like that. So you have to embrace a human flourishing perspective on your environment, and you have to embrace impact done intelligently. And if you do that, you can have it all. So you can have farms and factories and clean air and clean water and enjoy a wildlife. You can, you can have it all, but you need to look at your environment from a pro-human perspective. And I think that that's ultimately what I'm doing with fossil fuels. I think people look at fossil fuels from an anti-human environmental perspective. And so they're so obsessed with this idea that we're impacting climate. And they just assume, well, if we're impacting climate, that's immoral, we have to stop. Versus I look at it very clinically. I say, what are the benefits of using fossil fuels? What are the positive and negative side effects on climate and everything else? And I think if you look at it that way, we have certain, you know, there are certain challenges like more warming and relatively slow sea level rises, but, you know, and, and maybe some more storm intensity, but you have these huge benefits, including the ability to deal with climate disasters. And this is why empirically we've cut the death rate from climate disasters as we've used more fossil fuels over the last hundred years by a factor of 50. So most people don't realize this, but you're far less likely to die from a climate disaster than you used to be. It's also true that the far more people die of cold than of heat. So the idea of having some more warming shouldn't be alarming. But if that's looking at it from a pro-human perspective. If you look at it from an impact is evil perspective, then you can't really see the truth, which is fossil fuels are making the earth better for humans. Yeah. So delicate nurturer assumption is uh, also your uh, your uh, concept. You, you it's my to... term. I mean, I think it's it's characterizing. Um, I mean, there's there's trying to capture things with terms. So delicate nurturer is trying to get at the idea that that non-human nature exists in a delicate nurturing balance. So I mentioned it's stable, it's sufficient, it's safe, and then human impact ruins it. So I just I just came up with that term because I felt like it captured the element of, you know, impact will ruin it. And if we leave it alone, it'll it'll nurture us. Okay. Please uh, explain the probably new uh, new concept of yours, uh, concept of climate mastery. Well, so it's yeah, it's it's weird to say it's mine because I use I think I coined the term, but this is something we should all be familiar with. And and I I just ask people Think about, would you rather live in the climate of 100 years ago or today? You know, and you just think common sense. Or, you know, take 200 years ago if you want to make it totally, quote, natural. You just think even something like a routine thunderstorm that now could be the setting for a romantic evening with your partner or spouse would, could wreck your life, right? You are so vulnerable to climate. You know, any kind of drought, any kind of shortfall of rain, could starve you or ruin your, you know, your farm's economics. Uh, we can multiply all of these examples. You know, any kind of flood that would be trivial today could just wipe out all of your property. And what we should get from that is when you're thinking about our vulnerability to the climate, you can't just think about what's the state of the climate. You need to think about what's the state of our ability to master climate danger. And if you look at it from that perspective, what's happened is our ability to master climate danger has far outpaced any new climate challenges. And as long as that happens, you're more than fine. So people think, oh, you must be a climate change denier. Well, not at all. I think we impact climate. Uh, I don't think of that as all negative, but I think we impact climate. But the main thing we do is our ability to master climate increases far faster than any adverse uh, effects on climate. So we're, we're better off. And you see this uh, around the world. And you cannot think about climate impact or climate change without climate mastery. It's, it's exactly as if you were thinking about polio, but you didn't think about the existence of the polio vaccine. You couldn't think about the issue intelligently. Yeah. And you argue that modern world is unnaturally livable. What do you mean by that? So we often have this idea that we're, we're making the earth less livable, but we have livable means sort of how, how conducive is it to the life of the species that you're focused on? And I'm focused on human beings. And so we have, you know, what are our metrics we can measure that by? Well, one is life expectancy, one is income, and one is population. I think those are probably the three best. So how long do we live? How many resources do we have as we live? 
And then how many of us can live this length and have this many resources? And as I indicated before, we have 8 billion people now living a living far longer lives with far more usable resources than we've ever had in the history of this planet. So that should really, we should, that's what we should be talking about on Earth Day, by the way. How did the planet become so good for humans? And, and again, you can see this moral perspective of, are you on the human flourishing framework? Where you think, yeah, we made the Earth a lot better because it's a lot better for humans. Or do you think it, of it as, no, we made it a lot worse because we impacted a lot. And that's, that's the position a lot of thinkers are in, whether they admit it or not, is they think the Earth is worse than ever morally and environmentally, even though it's better for human beings than ever. And I think that's as close as you can get to a smoking gun that you have an anti-human environmental and even moral philosophy. If you think the most habitable, hospitable Earth ever for humans is the worst Earth ever, which many so-called environmentalists think. Uh, what do you mean when you say that we need to evaluate full context of rising CO2 levels, both negative consequences and benefits? So full context means that you look at all of the relevant factors to something. And if you, you look at, say, rising CO2 levels, more broadly rising greenhouse gas levels, but CO2 is, is the main one, uh, what you find is that it's looked at in a vacuum. So it's looked at as this is a problem and let's just let's make it our goal to get rid of this basically at all costs and you can see this with nations everyone's committing to a net zero by 2050 kind of goal so what they're saying is let's let's get rid of this evil co2 but then there there's a question i raised earlier if you have to look at the positives and negatives of co2 but even if you conclude it's on balance negative what about the benefits that come with it? The CO2 is not just randomly, we're not just randomly shooting it in the atmosphere for no reason. We're putting it in the atmosphere as a byproduct of using energy to power machines that make our lives much better. So you need to look at the benefits that come along with the CO2, especially because as we discussed, one of the big benefits is the ability to master climate, to keep ourselves safe from climate. You, you cannot... It's like fossil fuels are, are like the greatest drug ever because while they have side effects, they have benefits that can cure the side effect, which almost no drug has, right? Most drugs, they have benefits and side effects. And if the benefits are greater than you, and, and that's the best alternative, then you accept it. But fossil fuels, they can say, if they cause more drought, they can also cause more irrigation. They can also cause more crop transport, which is a big reason why we've, we've reduced the drought uh, death rate by over a hundred, by a factor of over a hundred in the last century. So, yeah, if you if you think of just CO two out of context, it's insane. Like it, it's it's exactly like saying I'm only going to look at vaccine side effects. I'm only going to look at antibiotic side effects. I'm only going to look at prescription drug side effects. You cannot think intelligently about it at all. And we should ask why why are so many thinkers doing that? You know, the general public might just not know. But why are so many thinkers just fixating on CO2, but not the benefits? And my ultimate answer is they don't really care about human life. Their focus is on an unimpacted planet. And so they don't care about the benefits of fossil fuels to human life because they don't think it's good to have a planet with a lot of human life because that's a planet with a lot of impact and they think impact is bad. And I, I talk about this in chapter three of the book, how ultimately the leading thinkers against fossil fuels have the belief that impact is bad. And if you think impact is bad, you think energy is bad. Because energy just allows us to impact the earth. That's what we do with it. We impact the earth. So if you hate impact, you hate not just the side effects of energy, you hate the benefits of energy. Uh, can you explain the common misconception of mistaking energy with electricity? Uh, I was intrigued by this problem. So. Sure. So energy, you know, energy to think about it as the ability to use machines to improve our lives. And there are many different types of machines that have many different, you could call them fuels. And in the world today, about one fifth of the world's machines are powered by electricity. Now, why is that? It's because the other 80% of the time, it's more cost effective to use something other than electricity. So I mentioned the case of heavy duty machinery. So you take something like uh, an airplane. Well, batteries have way less concentration of energy 
than oil fuels. If you try to put batteries in the plane, the plane's not going to take off or it's going to hold very few people or very little cargo. You want the densest fuel possible. And so until we have nuclear planes, we're probably get which nuclear is even denser, we're going to have oil powered planes. So you don't want an electric plane as in a battery plane or even a hydrogen plane is somewhere in between a battery plane and a um, and an oil plane. But the best way to do it that we know is just burning the fossil fuel directly. And this is often the case also for heat, whether you need to generate a lot of a very high level of heat for industry or a relatively low level of heat for your home. The question is always, what's the most efficient way to do it? And today, in many cases, the most efficient way to do it is say to burn natural gas directly versus electricity. If you look at say natural gas, which is a leading, which is in the US, the leading source of electricity and a rising source of electricity around the world, think about it. If you want heat in your home, does it make sense to just burn the gas directly or you can get something like 97% of what's called the heat content or the raw energy value of the gas? Or do you wanna burn the natural gas in a turbine like in a power plant where you're gonna lose say half the energy or close to that and then you're going to lose some in transmission. You're going to lose some when you're when you're transforming it into heat. It's more efficient to burn it directly. So when we, we think about energy, we can't equate it with electricity. And this is one of several fallacies that people advocating the replacement of fossil fuels with solar and wind do. They really don't want you to see how inferior solar and wind are today. And so one reason, one this is not the only thing, but one way they do that is they say, oh, well, solar and wind can produce electricity, so that's all you need. But but actually, electricity isn't most of energy today for, for good reasons. Uh, why do you think your approach is right when it goes against the consensus of thousands of scientists? One, one theme I talk about in the book, starting in chapter one, is you have to distinguish between what you're told by, oh, thank you, by institutions uh, is what different scientists say, and then what they actually say. So in chapter one, I talk about a concept, and this is another one, I, a term I made up called our knowledge system, which is the idea that when we are, when, when different claims are made about the truth and about what to do, those are, those are not just coming to us sort of directly from the science, in part because we don't directly access most of science, and in part because even if you do directly access science, there's a question of how do you evaluate it? What do you do about it? That's not something that can be answered purely by uh, by science. So we have we have people who do research, but then we have people who synthesize the research. And then we have often publications that disseminate the research. And then we have people who help us evaluate uh, the research. So when you see this thing about consensus, it's often some kind of quasi-political organization saying, hey, the physicists of the world think climate change is terrible and we should get rid of fossil fuels. But if you look at the actual papers, I don't think they justify that at all if you think rationally about the issue. So my, what I try to do in my work is get an idea of what are, different, what are different specialists, including climate scientists, but also including energy researchers and, and other kinds of environmental researchers, what have they actually discovered? What, is, you know, what are actually the most important findings? And then how do those add up in terms of the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels versus the alternatives? And I think all of the, I mean, I know all of these organizations that are supposedly claiming a consensus, none of them have gone through a remotely rigorous process of carefully weighing the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels. So I don't even think they're playing the same game. I think they're playing the game of let's look at CO2 as this out of context thing, let's not think about the benefits that come along with it. And let's just let's just focus on let's get rid of quote climate change, which basically means get rid of rising CO2, but not think about the benefits of CO2 and then not think about the costs. Therefore, you're not thinking about the cost of the policy. And if you want to see the, the results of this so-called consensus, look at what's happening around the world. Look at, you know, look at um, everyone's vulnerability to Russia. In especially Europe's, because Europe was trying to pursue less natural gas, which didn't make any sense. Look at the United States, where we used to have an amazing electric grid. And now where I live in California and in Texas, we have all sorts of troubles and blackouts. And around the country, we have electricity shortages. We're the wealthiest country in the world. We can't have reliable electricity. 
this is not a technological problem. This is a moral problem because we've listened to this phony consensus that fossil fuels are bad. So unfortunately, we're at a point in history where really bad thinkers have co-opted the prestige of science to advocate something that makes no sense, which is saying, let's deprive ourselves of the benefits of fossil fuels in the name of preventing relatively small climate changes. That doesn't make any sense because the benefits are so big. And if you have fossil fuels, you can deal with much larger climate changes than we're faced with. And uh, what do you think, uh, what should we do to defend energy freedom and freedom in general? Well, I think what, you know, what I try to do is I try to give people resources to make that really easy. I mean, ultimately, two big things you have to do are persuade your fellow citizens and then also give guidance to your elected officials in terms of the policy. And I think my, my work so far until about the last year has been best at persuading fellow citizens. So of course you can recommend Fossil Future, but you can also go to a website, energytalkingpoints.com, which is totally free. And you can, you can sign up for a newsletter, which I highly recommend, but you can use that website. You can search any topic and you can get really good, what I call talking points. So explanations of the issues that you can use, that you can share. My goal has been to try to make it easy for people to persuade their fellow citizens. Now, my current focus for the last year and, and going forward is actually coming up with the policies that we need. So I'm working in the United States on nuclear policy, fossil fuel policy, pollution policy, because I think ultimately you need to know what should I tell in the U.S.? What do I tell my congressman to do? What do I tell the president to do? So it's this we need to persuade people to think about the issue differently. And then we need to ultimately advocate specific policies. And so I just say, right now, I have kind of everything you could want on persuading your citizens. More and more, I'll have policies. So I hope that people check out energytalkingpoints.com and sign up for that newsletter, because that's the best way to, um, to follow this. And I, I think what we have in the U.S. will be in large part useful in Poland as well. And in some ways, Poland has, you know, there's been some embrace of nuclear, there's some exciting developments, but there's also a lot of bad thinking in Poland like there is everywhere else. So I, I hope that the publication of the book and this interview help the Polish people think much better about this, uh, this issue, because you do not want to go down the same path that much of Europe is going down. You probably realize that for other issues, and this is another one. Okay, and uh, you said that your basic education was founded on the exact sciences, and then you switched to philosophy. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, this is when I was younger, but I went at a high, to a high school for research science, you know, to train me to be a research scientist. This is just, I, I was always very interested in logical thinking, and at first this drew me to the so-called hard sciences, and of course I still study them by studying energy, but I also love the humanities because the humanities are a little bit deeper in the sense of if you're thinking about, say, physics, there's still a question of what are your thinking methods to think about physics? And then how do you act on the knowledge that you get from physics? And these are things that are philosophical questions. And so I like the idea of not just studying specific fields, but thinking about the methods we use, thinking about the values we apply thinking about some of our basic assumptions, like this issue of the delicate nurture view of Earth, is that true? I think many scientists, including climate scientists, accept this. So philosophy helps you step back and you can, you can think of it as an X-ray. You're taking an X-ray and, hey, what are the thinking methods? What are the assumptions? What are the values that everyone is using? And what's the actual right way? And if you can combine that with practical knowledge, it's very useful. Now you can't do it with everything. So I'm kind of obsessed with one field. I know a lot about energy and the associated environmental issues. And then I know a lot about uh, philosophy, but I hope that other people follow the example and do the same in, in other fields and have a pro-human philosophy and that they apply it to other issues that I'm not gonna ever have the bandwidth to, to do. Uh, and last question into how many languages this book was translated? I don't know, not enough. I think it's still less than 10. I th and, and a bunch of them are in process. I know we have Spanish. Uh, I think there's Vietnamese. I think German is in progress. But if anyone wants to translate it, just email me, alex at alexepstein.com. Uh, and so I'm super grateful to whoever translated into Polish. And I really want to get my own copy uh, of it. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting interview. And I will, would like to host you 
more in our channel Nam Zależy. Uh, so thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great day. Okay, great day. Bye.